Airborne wind energy is an up-and-coming renewable energy technology that seeks to make improvements in the wind energy harvesting sector. In the 1980s, airborne wind energy was thought to possibly be able to replace the large three-bladed turbines that we see today. That didn't end up being a viable solution, however, and the idea was shelved for about 20 years until the early 2000s when research groups picked the idea back up. This time around, however, the thought is not to replace current technologies, but actually to enhance the abilities in the wind energy sector. Airborne wind technologies are capable of operating at both higher and lower wind speeds than your typical turbines. Also, the small size is attractive for being able to install in remote and even temporary locations. Furthermore, it might be possible to access some of the high altitude winds using airborne wind technology. In this work, we began exploring a subset of airborne wind aircraft using a suite of tools called Flow and Steady developed at the Brigham Young University Flight Optimization and Wind Lab, or Flow Lab. Here we have an example of a windcraft. I started out calling it a wind harvesting aircraft, but after dominating my lab meeting time for a few weeks, I decided to remove a few syllables, and I ended up with windcraft. Now, a windcraft could be many things, and I even toyed with calling it a kite, but I figured that that would be a little too general because it included soft fabric kites as well. For my purposes here, I define a windcraft as what we see in this visual, a fixed wing aircraft designed specifically for the purpose of harvesting wind energy. In this study, we looked specifically at a drag-based design that generates power through a set of onboard turbines and transfers the harvested energy through the tether to the ground station. I should also note that for the purposes of this study, we neglected the rotor pylons and the tail structure and focused on the rotor on wing interactions. Basically all airborne wind solutions, including windcraft, operate in crosswind flight conditions. This means that the flight path is in a plane nearly perpendicular to the free stream wind vector or across the wind. This allows the windcraft to be flown similar to a kite, meaning that in an ideal situation, with sufficient wind speeds, you wouldn't require any propulsion to keep the windcraft flying. In fact, most other airborne wind designs don't utilize rotors and therefore have no options for in-flight propulsion. Thus, in theory, for our design, the rotors can be dedicated solely to energy harvesting when in crosswind flight patterns. That being said, drag-based windcraft like this actually do require that the rotors be able to operate as propellers to get the vehicle from the ground station up into crosswind flight. This seems to be a more viable solution than forcefully throwing the windcraft into the air, though that has been done for other designs. Requiring both thrust and generation from the propellers proves to be an interesting problem, but one that we did not tackle in this study. Instead, we look only at the windcraft already in crosswind flight, specifically in the downstroke portion of the flight path. To be even more specific, we looked at a 72 degree swath beginning just past the halfway point down the circle and ending at the bottom. For now, we have only looked at sections of the circular path due to the extended computational time of the simulations. We chose to prioritize the bottom section because the windcraft will naturally be moving faster at the bottom due to acceleration from gravity. In this faster section, more energy should be extracted by the rotors, and thus it would be at the bottom that we should see the worst case portion of the path. As I mentioned at the beginning, to model the windcraft aerodynamics, we used Flow and Steady, which is a suite of aerodynamic analysis tools developed at the BYU Flow Lab. The all-star of this set of tools is the Viscous Vortex Particle Method, or VPM. A VPM can be described as a mesh-free, computational fluid dynamics method for the solution of the vorticity form of the Navier-Stokes equations, which we get by taking the curl of the more common momentum formulation. When I say mesh-free, I mean that the VPM is a Lagrangian rather than an Eulerian numerical scheme. I won't go into further details here, but there are some references in the paper that would be helpful to those interested in more information on the VPM. We started our study off with the windcraft in a steady level flight attitude. This does not exactly match the crosswind case, 
but it did allow us to fine-tune some aspects of the simulation in preparation for a more complicated application. Specifically, we found early on that care must be taken to maintain numerical stability. The VPM does very well until a wake reaches turbulent breakdown, at which point the solver can become unstable. In order to maintain simulation stability, we first attempted to delay turbulent breakdown by using fewer rotor blades than our original design, which we had approximated from publicly available images of the Makani M600 prototype. In the end, we chose a three-blade rotor rather than a five-blade rotor with which we began. We also ran the rotor at a tip speed ratio that both maximized the power generation of our rotor design and somewhat delayed the turbulent breakdown of the wakes. Namely, we ran the rotors at a tip speed ratio of 4, which equates to an advance ratio of roughly 0.8. In addition, to keep the simulation stable for enough time to get reasonable data, we trimmed the wakes behind the rotors at one cord length after the wing trailing edge. We also found that if we trimmed the entire wake one span length after the trailing edge, we could decrease the computational loads, while still maintaining the same level of accuracy of a simulation with an untrimmed wake. As we see in this plot, the lift coefficient for the wing with a trimmed and untrimmed wake matches very well after both achieve stationarity. Note that the small ups and downs for the trimmed case occur due to our trimming the wake every 10 time steps to save on computational costs. The paper includes some of our results for the steady level case, but since the overall trends are the same for the crosswind flight path, and circles are more interesting than straight lines, let's discuss the results from our circular path simulations. Here, we are looking at the normal force distribution, that is, the force along the vector normal to the wing surface at the wing root. We opted for this force rather than lift when looking in the crosswind flight case, because in this case, lift becomes somewhat convoluted, or more precisely, how one defines the free stream vector becomes somewhat arbitrary. To see this clearly, let's look again at the flight path we used in our study. One could argue that the free stream could be considered along the vector in which the wind is flowing. This would cause the lift vector to move relative to the wing, though, and thus isn't very useful. Now we could also take the average velocity seen by the aircraft from both the wind and its ground velocity, making lift always relative to the wing. But lift in this case doesn't actually mean much because it has little to do with keeping the windcraft airborne. Probably the most useful force vector to look at when considering the entire system would be the force in line with the tether. But in this study, we've neglected any controls aspects. Those using the normal force seem to be more intuitive for our usage overall. As we can see in this animation, the force distribution is changed by the rotor wakes, as we would expect. We have portions of the distribution that are increased relative to the nominal case, that is the case with no rotors present, as well as portions that are decreased relative to the nominal. Interestingly, the effects extend beyond just the region behind the rotors, and we can see that the force distribution is also affected in the outboard sections of the wing. Overall, we expected the rotor wakes to decrease the overall normal force seen by the wing, since in our case, the rotors are extracting momentum from the fluid domain. That is in contrast to, say, an inline distributed propulsion case, such as the NASA X-57 shown in this video clip from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, where the rotors are imparting momentum to the fluid, and we see an overall increase in wing normal force. Since our rotors are operating opposite from how propellers do, we assume that the normal force would decrease. We set out in this study to find out by how much the normal force would decrease, and potentially move on to finding ways to mitigate that decrease. Contrary to our first guess, however, the rotors in this offset configuration actually lead to an increase of wing normal force. To decipher why this is happening, we looked at two things, the first being the velocity magnitude across the wing. In the nominal case, the wing has a linear velocity gradient from the slower moving wing tip closer to the center of the circular path to the faster moving wing tip toward the outside of the path. When we look at the wing with rotor wakes present, we see, as expected, that the velocity profile has portions of decreased velocity over the wing. Perhaps not initially intuitive, however, we also see portions of increased velocity over the wing as well. Thus, with the rotors offset like they are, not only do they extract momentum from the fluid flow, but at some points they actually entrain increased velocity between them. Then, as the wakes pass across the wing, the wing sees both higher and lower velocities than the nominal case. 
the higher velocities outweigh the lower ones, leading to an overall increased velocity contrary to our original hypothesis. Second, we looked at the structure of the rotor wakes over the wing. Remember that the wind vector is nearly aligned with the wing normal in this case, so we see that the rotor wakes are being pushed nearly along the wing normal vector. As we saw in the normal force distribution, this appears to cause an overall increase in the force distribution behind the rotors in addition to the increased velocity and train between the rotors. Averaging over many rotor revolutions, we see the overall augmentation of the normal force experienced by the wing, despite the rotors extracting momentum from the overall flow. This is worth further investigation, given our initial expectations, and we will be conducting further studies to both verify and further explore these phenomena. As mentioned, this increase was present for both the steady level and crosswind flight cases, though we saw a greater increase in the normal force in the crosswind case than we did in the lift force in the steady level case. It should also be noted that the circular path case did not have a constant velocity, but rather a linearly changing velocity as the windcraft traveled from a higher portion of the path to a lower one. In conclusion, we were at first surprised, and in the end, excited about our results. We found that despite our system extracting energy from the overall fluid flow, the wing itself experienced increased normal force. We expect to move forward, diving deeper into the details of this phenomenon through a more complete set of studies. We plan to explore various flight path and wind velocities, rotor tip speed ratios, as well as windcraft configurations, specifically with rotor placement and rotation direction. We are also excited about looking further into rotor design, specifically for the dual functionality requiring both thrust and power generation for vertical takeoff windcraft. Thank you.